Got your jobbers there, dude? Yeah, I got. I haven't put them in yet. I don't want to kill the battery. Oh, it lasts like supposed, five hours. Yeah. Oh, yeah. These are so much more comfortable than the other ones, too. Well, you know what? I like them better than my sports ones because the sport ones are hard to get set just right, and the tone is much better. The sport This thing are, tells you when they're not in your ear right. Did yeah. you see that? That's right. Oh, hang on. Oh, no. Oh, oh. Is it now yeah, now the helps. world is the world is now in surround sound for me. That's Touch the left one, and it'll cycle between noise canceling, hear through, and off. Yeah, oh, I think that's done it. I think that's done it because you can hear the room hear too. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's cool. better because now I'm not hearing anything in the room. See how see how see how everything sounds. <laughs> Look at your face. Mark's like what? <laughs> what? Can you hear now, now Mark? Coming through to me. Hold on. It's the Jabra's the eighty five T's. Welcome. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole new world for me. It is. It's cool, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. See yeah. how clear everything sounds? I feel like I feel like a child again. I feel like I've just discovered sound. <clears throat> Here we go. All right. <clears throat> yep. Here we go. I'm Scott Rouse, I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement and the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, Body Language Tactics, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hi, I'm Chase Hughes. Did 20 years in the U.S. military, published the number one best-selling book in behavior and persuasion. Now I teach behavior, persuasion, and interrogation to intelligence agencies and the general public. Greg. I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior. I spend most of my time on Wall Street and in corporate America, and I put together this course with Scott, Body Language Tactics at BodyLanguageTactics.com. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about Scott Peterson. The panelists have spoken again, and everybody wants to hear about this guy. And as you guys, I can't believe we haven't done this guy before. This is this is the most hilarious thing I've ever seen as far as somebody trying to lie. I can see why people want to want to see this. So we're going to be uh, looking at just uh, seven videos. And we have a special little thing at the end of this. We're going to try for the first time uh, that will involve the panelists. That's you. And you'll be able to tell us what's going to happen, what you think is happening in the last video. We're not going to go over that one, but we'll, we'll get more in depth of that when we get to it. Greg, what are we going to say about Scott Peterson? Yeah, so Scott Peterson is a very old case, but it's pertinent again. He was um, found guilty and given a death sentence, and that has been not commuted, but it is going to be retried because of some jury selection irregularities. So his next hearing is the 27th of April. That will be interesting. You'll get to see him in front of the camera again. Not sure when the actual trial will go, but the sentencing piece will be retried, and so he'll be hot in the news again. Cool. All right, well, let's take a look at the first video. I think everybody sitting at home wants the answer to the same question. Did you murder your wife? No, no, I did not. And I had absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance. And, and you use the word murder, and yeah, I mean, that is a, a possibility. Um, it's not one we're ready to accept, and it creeps in my mind late at night and early in the morning. And during the day, all we can think about is the right resolution is to find her well. Yeah. Okay, Chase, what do you got? I think before I get into it, the most important thing that came out of this case was called the Lacey and Connor Law, or Unborn Victims of Violence Act that charges a criminal uh, with injuring an unborn child in uh, acts of violence. And I think... Throughout the video, what you're going to see is some very slow eye blink speed, which I, I refer to as shutter speed, not how often, but how fast the lid closes and opens. I think there's some Valium or some Xanax uh, going on here for sure, uh, which is like a, a, a Dollar General trial consultant was probably hired uh, for something like this. And... So I watched this video differently than I've ever watched any before, partly because I was in the car. <laughs> so I, I listened to audio first. <laughs> so I just processed the audio first separately from everything and separated audio and visual here. So that's how I'll give it to you. 
So on the audio section, we have fading facts. Scott's famous for coining this, I think. Or he's like, no, no. There's a non-contracted denial, which just means instead of I didn't or don't, it's I did not or do not. Like I did not have sexual relations with that woman is a non-contracted denial. And he had nothing to do with her disappearance. And you see his head move forward, eyebrows up when he says disappearance. He's just kind of forcing you to accept the disappearance part of this. And I think when he says murder is a possibility, I think that's he's being truthful because that is a possibility. And he is he is actually thinking about it. He won't mention her name. This is something that's very common in, in guilty people. I'm failing to mention the victim's name. And he says the right resolutions to find her. Uh, resolution is not at all what's needed if someone's missing. A resolution is meaningless and, and doesn't really do anything here. For visual, there's an immediate retreat to internal dialogue. You'll see his eyes go down in this direction immediately. And you'll see that's his habitual deceptive behavior for him. It's different from his normal place that he goes. There's a postural tilt. There's eye blocking on his denial. And there's a lack of pronouns. I won't tackle the rest of these, but uh, I think it's interesting when he says absolutely nothing to do with it. You see a little single shoulder shrug goes up, which means, suggests or denotes, as Scott would say, that the person sometimes, most of the time, will lack confidence in what they're saying. And Scott, I'll pass it up to you. I still uh, suggest denotes indicates from Joe Navarro. <laughs> okay. he, says that all, he says that all the time. So it just jumps out uh, from that. So a lot of ways, this this is very similar in the beginning anyway, to Chris Watts, the, one, the guy we did last time. And you, I could almost take the ver my very first um, notes on that one and exchange them for this one because we're seeing a lot of the very same things in, in this one that we that we saw there um one of the things that, that we saw in chris watts as well as here is that really really strong eye contact he has with her and that's why greg and i in our um thing the true crime workshop course we teach a thing about called strip and there's a thing in there called romancer they, there's uh stancer transfer romancer insulator and then prancer so, but this is romancer and the romancer is the person who looks at you. They're like, really? Yeah, they're really helpful. And they just like stare at you. But this guy's doing two things with his romancer, because when they look at you like that, they want to make sure that you feel okay with them being that close to you and watching every move you make, because what they're doing at this point is making sure you believe them. And we talk about that all the time as well, where someone his blink rates really low because he's just firing off a bunch of bull and hoping she'll believe it. So that's why he keeps. That's why his his eyes are locked on it like that. His eyebrows are up, uh, up as in what you know. Hey, believe that, believe that, don't you? Yeah, right, right. Am I right? That kind of thing. Um, and then again, yeah, Chase is right. It's fading facts. Everything. And this is I've never heard anybody talk this quietly when they're being asked about if they murdered somebody. You don't go. No, I would never do anything like that. You go. No, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. I don't know what you're talking about. Get me out of here. Where's my life? You're going to be flipping out at that point. And there's no, not going to be any calm in here. So I think Chase, you're right as well. There's probably some, 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 something helping calm him down in this. But that's still, it's not helping his case because it makes it look unnatural. And it sounds unnatural. That and during that, and when he says possibility, that's when we're seeing that head nod and that that little that little shrug in there. And again, we hear, I believe this is one where we hear absolutely, if I remember correctly, this is absolutely in here as well. And for an, such an emotional, it's supposed to be an emotionally um, taxing uh, interaction here, talking about your wife, you don't know where she is yet. Is she dead or not? He didn't look too worried to me about it. I've never seen anybody smile that big. OJ Simpson does a good job of it on one of his things, but I've never seen somebody smile that big and answering the same question where 15 seconds ago, 10 seconds ago was, you know, did you kill your wife? Did you murder your wife? And then have a smile come up in there that big. A creepy factor, 10 on this one. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I've never come across this guy, Scott Peterson, before. Every time I say I haven't seen these people, uh, you know, panelists go, where have you been? I've been all over the place, but mainly not watching television, I think. Or certainly not watching the same television that, that you've been watching. Not that that's a problem. Keep on watching that TV. It's, it's fantastic. But, you know, I've lived in different places, not necessarily ever in the U.S., 
uh, for any uh, length of time. And so, uh, and so just haven't seen what you've been seeing. So I approach this very, very fresh, not done any baseline. All I'm doing is going, what do I see in this moment when we've got somebody who's asked a question about, you know, did you murder your wife? Uh, I see a lot of eye blocks, too many to count, in fact. So I stopped. <laughs> so lots of eye blocking. Uh, lots of requests for approval uh, around this as well, even before kind of the questions are. So he knows he knows what's coming and he's kind of going, okay, bring this one on. We'll see that gesture later on as well. Um, uh, absolutely fading facts. It's not, it, uh, it's just not dot, 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 dot. Doesn't really finish that. It just peters out. Uh, I agree, could be some, some uh, drugs involved there. Uh, it is quite lethargic. However, it's about as energized as he gets in this because we'll see even the energy decline over this even more. It could be other factors involved, could be the drugs kicking in even more if that's the case. That smile, it's not usual for this kind of situation, I would say. Now, again, is this a smile around you know, drugs? Is this a smile around something else? Not quite knowing how to match what, what, what performance to give, what emotions should be there to match this situation. The biggest piece for me in this is we are um, ready to accept and all we can think about. Like, who, like who else is involved in? We're, we're talking about you. We're talking about, did you kill her? We don't need to bring in other people. Well, you probably do if you want to now get a bit of social acceptance. You want to say, hey, it's not just me. There's a whole bunch of us. There's a whole bunch of us. There's a whole bunch of us. They can't think I did it because I'm part of a group. So, so it's that bringing in the kind of gang identity. Now, you might have some better ideas, you know, as to what you think he's saying by we. You've probably seen stuff that I haven't seen. That's, that's great. So if you've got other ideas as to why he's saying we, stick them in, down in below. But for me, it's kind of odd that he's bringing other people into this. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so Mark, we're going to start off with where you ended. We. We is blame sharing. When somebody does something and they shift pronouns, and you talk about it all the time, Chase, with team pronouns, I call it blame sharing. I hear it all the time in corporate America. I, I, I accomplished, we fell short. That's blame sharing. That's how it works. That's how people use that pronoun. I've seen one other person smile this way under high duress, and it was part of his baseline. This is many, many years ago when I was a SEER instructor, and there was a Navy SEAL who came through who had a smile like that, and no matter how hard you were on this guy, the smile would get worse. It was a baseline for that guy. This guy's going to prove to us in just a minute it's not his baseline. And so that nervous, I call the guy smiling boy back then, I remember, and I told him, if you ever get captured, try your best not to do that because it's going to be rough for you. And that's because nobody believes you when you do that. This is not this guy's baseline. I think we're going to find. So we'll look and see what is his baseline. He starts off with a, <clears throat> what I would call a lip grip or we would call lip compression. You can see it. That's containing something. Chase says that's containing more facts, more data. I can, most often I find it to be emotion, which is facts or data. So you see it all the time. When, when you see men who have been caught in a sex scandal, almost all of them do this. It, you see it all the time. Go back and look for pictures of many of them. Anthony he, Weiner. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I could list the many. There, there's actually a great meme that shows all these guys doing that and then a picture of a dog who does it, and it says, I think my dog has been involved in a sex scandal. So <laughs> it's funny. You know, It's just the way men do it all the time. The eye blocking is pronounced. And Chase, that down left, he's navigating. To me, if I give you a math equation, you know, I'll, I'll play this game with you a little bit. Forget the math equation. Try to think through what you would tell us if you were captured while you're looking at us right now. If you were captured and you were accused of a crime and you're trying to lie about it, think about how you would go about that lie. Just the mere fact of thinking about it is going to take you into internal conversation, which is down here. This guy has practiced and he's smarter than, he, than everybody around him, I think he thinks. People I've read where people said he was charming, it's probably that. It's all that eye contact and all that. Just remember, he's talking to Diane Sawyer. This is not the, the woman who works at the gelato place that he can charm. So he's probably, and we're going to see her, that she's on to him as this thing goes through. He used the word murder, and then his smile gets bigger, which tells me it's nervous energy as he's releasing. Watch his control release style as he tries to tell the story through the whole thing. And then he goes, yeah. And he talks about we, 
And then he flips through and says, the last one is not just a fading fact, it's a throwaway fact, because he didn't think of the order to say things. And he says, late at night, early in the morning, during the day, and then he goes into that to find her, and then he yeah. throws away a word, well. What? What? Oh, to find her, well. That's a throwaway. To me, I would be all over him. There are five or six places I would climb all over him here because we talk about baseline and we talk about do, 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 it's like an EKG and then suddenly there's a spike. He's got about four or five spikes here that I would look at and go after him pretty hard. And that's what I got. Cool. I think everybody sitting at home wants the answer to the same question. Did you murder your wife? No, no. I uh, just not. And I had absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance. And, and you use the word murder, and yeah, I mean, that is a, a possibility. Um, it's not one we're ready to accept, and it creeps in my mind late at night and early in the morning. And during the day, all we can think about is the right resolution is to find her well. All right. Ready to move on? Yeah. All right. Everybody good? <clears throat> Everyone's good. Okay, let's it's move along. It is like, heck, like is. listening to everybody on the radio. Yeah, it is really a little. Nice. Yeah, it's really nice, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. I like yeah. it. Did you ever hit her? Did you ever injure her? No, no. My God, no. Um, violence towards women is unapproachable. It is the most disgusting act to me um, and I know that uh, suspicion has turned to me and it's um, it's turned to me one because I'm her husband and that's a natural thing and I've heard all the statistics on all the news shows about that being you know someone that uh, a husband ex-husband a boyfriend that is statistically the one who would be responsible for her disappearance and um, I'm sorry, I forgot your question. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so he starts off, his respiration is up. You can't miss it. His, his, color, or his, his color is rising and dropping. His internal conversation is back, his eyes down to left. Then he goes, no, no, God, no. Holy ground. Immediately jumps to something as God is my witness. Those are things that every one of us interrogating would go, hold, hold on. Why is God your witness? No, no, God, no. And then he does one eyebrow up in some kind of skepticism of her, and it may even be contempt. And then as he does this disappearance and pushes his tongue out, right at the end of that, and I'm not a big micro-expression guy, look for a micro-expression of fear, that flatness in his face. If you pause it, you'll see a micro-expression of fear. And if I see it, you're going to be able to see it really easily because I don't use those very much. Uh, and he eye blocks and raises his eyebrows at the same time, which is a hard one to do. That has to be something going on inside your head to cause it because you don't usually do it. And then I'm not going to take everything, but I'm going to say, my notes say rambling BS answer, which is exactly what I think all this is. And then he finally says, I wish he would just say what he's thinking. Um, you know, I've been trying to avoid your questions so hard, I can't remember what you asked me because he rambles forever. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, there's a generalization. He takes it from something which is about him into violence against women generally. So that's a, that's a redirect, I would, I would suggest. And then he comes to, I think, authority, natural statistics, news shows, uh, husband, ex-boyfriend. Although this, this is focusing it on him, what he's doing is going, I've really researched this. Like, so I kind of know the way you're thinking about me. And surely I wouldn't think and research this with such authority if I'd actually done this thing. So he's trying to use this, these authority tags here to put us off the trail, I believe. And ultimately he goes through such a list there that he, he redirects himself to such an extent that I truly believe he forgets what the original question was. I think, you know, based on this idea, this premise at the start, that that perhaps there's some, uh, you know, mood adjusting drugs involved. And he is, you know, when you think about that, he does start to sound like somebody just leaning against a bar, telling the bartender the story, you know. With the, exactly, you know, so seven whiskeys <laughs> into it, you know, like, I can't believe 
what happened in this. But but uh, all the same, you know, he's lost his own story. I believe he's redirected so much. Uh, so that's what I got on that one. Uh, Chase, what do you got? So I just want to say that I think killing other people is bad to me. I mean, that's that's my opinion. But I wouldn't need to say that because we all agree that violence is bad unless I'm trying to force you to see me as a good person or force you to look at me a certain way. And I think this is the most telling thing I've ever seen, that the statistics that he's quoting here don't say that it's the husband, boyfriend, fill in the blanks, whoever that's responsible for the disappearance. It's not the word disappearance. It's murder. That's what the statistics say, murder. So what we're seeing, we are witnessing his comfort level with replacing the word murder with disappearance. So we're literally seeing that he's taken the word murder from the statistics and replaced it with disappearance. And he's comfortable doing that here in his interview. And I think that tells us quite a bit. And I think this is a perfect textbook, single shoulder shrug. Say that three times fast. <laughs> I wish you guys could leave us audio comments in the, in the video down here. Uh, when he's responsible for her disappearance, there's a, there's a perfect little shrug there. And there's that micro expression after the word disappearance, which is almost a pucker. And Mark does that perfect thing where he's talking about a lemon, <laughs> which I think is associated with disagreement. I think anytime a pucker, you can say there's probably some, some disagreement going on there. Scott. Okay. Well, we're seeing again, we're seeing a lot. We're seeing a lot of the class. We're revisiting the classics here. Uh, in body language, we're seeing we're seeing fading facts, or we're hearing fading facts. In other words, and I think the reason that he he loses his place at when he when when she asks him the question, he gets to the end. I can't remember because he's so wrapped up in trying to remember what he's supposed to say. I think these. I agree with you, Mark. At the same time, I think what's happening is he's got he knows what these whether they've said. Here's the questions you can ask, and you ask these and nothing else. Maybe that's happened. Maybe he found out what the questions were, or maybe. Like in, when you get witness prep happen and you say, this is probably going to be what the questions are. Here's how you answer those. He's ready. And I think that's when he's looking down. That's where he's going is to recall those things, is to recall his answers. And he gets so far along in that and gets off trail just for a second and then loses his place. And he can't find his way back to, where, to what the question was. That's why he doesn't know. What it, the questions he's asking isn't really what he's concerned about. He, he thinks he's answered that already. But then he starts adding those qualifiers onto the end of it because it's a pretty big deal when you get asked questions like that so he's trying to make her believe that that he's being honest with her and then we see at what he's what's supposed to be when he starts talking about something being disgusting it's a really lame if it is, even is an attempt to show disgust an expression of disgust he doesn't show it he's disgust is like yeah that's disgust but this guy is i got a big nose so you can see this easily his his nostrils flare just a little bit and, it, and his mouth kind of comes up along the sides here, but it, it happens wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't happen the right way. It doesn't happen in the middle and start on the sides of the nose there. We won't get into the technicalities of what that's called because it's boring, but these little parts right here, when you do that, uh, that's part of it. It involves your nose. So hey, that's why I noticed it. So it's, it's, we're not seeing a true um, expression of disgust there. His blink rate still really slow. He's still locking in with her. Uh, with it, with his with his eyes, he's still looking at her and, and trying to make make that contact with her. And what he's doing, Chase, you got to help me come up with a word for this because I mention it all the time and I, I can't figure out anything to call it. You're good at that, but when as as he's going through this, as he's feigning this emotional um, horror that he's going through, this this horrible emotional feeling he's going through, he looks away and it, he's looking away to give her permission to look at him and to observe, quote unquote, his pain. And, and, and what he's going through. That's what he's doing there. I don't have a name for it. I'm sure by the time this is over, Jay, uh, Chase will squirt one out. But uh, as far as that goes, I don't have a name for it. But that's, what, that's what's one. happening at that point. Uh, what do you, what do you, Chase, what do you got? Mask I, display. Mask display. That's a good one. I think yeah, that's, pretty good. that's a good one. But it's, it's, uh, Close it's up. included with eye aversion or gaze aversion. 
Yeah. I think but, that's yeah, included. Somewhere. It is. It is. Yeah. And Greg's right with that. With, when you, when you draw on that way, but the sole purpose of doing this is just to let her observe him going through this pain. There's that. So well, well, it's, fe it's feigned emotional display is all it is, right? It's, yeah. Yeah. It's all it is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, tra I trained some clients to Fain. give a moment for viewers to see them without being seen. So just a, a move away, you know, do something somewhere else, just so that you can be observed without you observing the observer. It causes the observer of you to feel more confident in how they're feeling about you. Because, you know, you didn't notice that they were looking at that point. So you can't have been putting on a mask at that point because like you, you were just checking something else out. So they, they, they feel like they've seen the authentic you because you were messing about with something else. There you go. Well, if you watch movies, actors do it all the time. And I think we are conditioned by movies to think that's how people respond to move and act. And when you see a really bad movie and they don't do that and they're doing all their emotion in front of you and it looks like a really horrible mask, I think that's why people instinctively think that's how people normally look, even if we know it's not true. Yeah. And that, and that I'll go back to that, that part where he talks about the violence towards women, how it's disgusting for him. That's if you read that, that's a Twitter post. Perfect. And be like, what do you think about violence, women and violence? And he would just, that's what he would go like. I got this. I know this one. I know this one. The women. I think it that's was what that is. Really, really weird that he used the word unapproachable. Yeah. Well, I he's think got he's some really, he's got real words in here. Yeah. yeah. He's got, yeah. yeah. Coming up, a lot of prepared, real, a lot of canned words. responses. A lot of canned responses are coming out of this guy. If you notice, the one interesting thing is fight or flight started because he's his upper lip is getting wet. I love that part of the whole yeah. thing that we didn't, yeah. none of us mentioned. So, yeah, okay, it's true. When he started oh. on the violence thing, I thought he was going to go for violent delights and violent. <laughs> I, thought was, I thought it was Ramirez all over again. I thought he going to hashtag it with something, you know, that and hashtag no violence towards women, you know, something like that. So. Did you ever hit her? Did you ever injure her? No, no. My God, no. Um, violence towards women is unapproachable. It is the most disgusting act to me. Um, and I know that uh, suspicion has turned to me. And it's, um, it's turned to me, one, because I'm, her husband, and that's a natural thing. And I've heard all the statistics on all the news shows about that being, you know, someone that uh, a husband, ex-husband, a boyfriend, that is statistically one who would be responsible for her disappearance. And um, I'm sorry, I forgot your question. Okay, we good? Yeah. Yep. All right. I'm sorry, I forgot your question. <laughs> Did you ever hit her? Did you no, ever injure her? No, no, never. Um, I was, I was answering your question because of the suspicion that it's been turned to me. And it turned to me because of the inappropriate romantic um, uh, that I had with Amber Fry. Oh, man, that's bad. <laughs> this is comedic. Yeah. If okay. it weren't so sad, it would be funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're laughing at this knucklehead, not with him. Trust us. <laughs> well, okay. Here we go. <laughs> it's that yep. gum out. Yeah. Jeez, I knew something was wrong. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm just going to hit a couple of these because this is not a long clip. He conditions everything he says. He, he actually chuckles a little bit under his breath, which I find odd yeah. in the situation you're in. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of opportunities to make a mistake. He's got all these crazy words he used, and he, this is a control release. You can tell it's control release, and he's telling a story because he says, I answered your question because suspicion that has been turned to me. How much more passive can you get than, hey, I'm under, maybe I'm guilty? Suspicion that has been turned to me. That's how many distances in Chase. I know you're going to cover the distancing piece. But this is a prepared question. He jumped the gun. He got nervous. And then my favorite is not only does he distance himself from the affair, not only does he distance himself from that, 
but he even conditions it by saying the inappropriate whatever word he uses there. It's just the most distancing crap I've ever heard to say, look, I was having an affair, so of course people are looking at me. That's probably what you would expect from a guy who is holding up his hand and saying, look, I made some guilt. This is trading guilt. He's saying, look, I was screwing around on my wife, and that's why people are looking at me. But even then, he conditions his trading guilt question. This is layer after layer after layer of BS. That's the way I look at it. Scott, what do you got? Yeah. And the the, the whole answer is just, he says it in the, in the tone of a child or like it's, it goes back and forth between being a child and talking to a child, not a child talking to a child. But it's like he's talking to her like something's wrong with her. You know, he's talking to her like she does, like to make it really simple for her to understand. Again, feigning that um, the horrible emotional experience he's supposed to be supposed to be going through. And you're right. He doesn't even say what this romantic thing was. He just says romantic and then goes on. Man, that's 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 pretty bad. That's that's pretty bad. Some of these things in here we're going to see, uh, and and like we always say, we're we're laughing because it's it's not the situation is horrible, but what's happening now that we know, obviously this guy's guilty. Man, it's hilarious watching him do this. I mean, it's 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 almost tough to watch. What are you going to say, Greg? Yeah, we, we always say we're Switzerland. Yeah, we are Switzerland. We don't care. We're not saying he's guilty. But guys, what we're telling you is. This would be a field day in an interrogation room with this guy's body language. Every one of us yeah. would go, hold on a minute. Yeah. So, yeah. And right, right out of the gate where he says, no, no, no. Again, we have fading facts. Every time something important happens, man, it gets really quiet. And he starts talking about it. So, and his mouth starts moving not very much. His diction goes out the window. Just starts getting horrible. And I can't believe she didn't call him on that and say, look, man, you got to talk louder. Our sound guys over here give me this, you know, to talk louder, talk louder, or however you do that. Because that's 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 just so lame. Um, that's, yeah, the eyebrows up for approval. No, you know, it's it just, these are all the classics. These are all the classics. And Greg, you, carry, you, you covered most of it. I don't know what's going to be left for you two guys. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so this is kind of late night after uh, dark talk show kind of yeah. <laughs> kind of stuff. He's he, for me, it feels like he's almost trying to use this as uh, a a confession to a bartender. It really is that I'm going to create some kind of relationship, soft relationship with the person on the other side, give them give them my heartbreak. It's rather like he's rolled up to the bar, he's had a bunch of whiskeys, and he's now going to sh say, you know, this is breaking my heart. It's got that kind of rhythm to it, that kind of sense to it. And, and to that extent, um, uh, it is kind of inappropriately romantic. <laughs> it is adding this gloss of, of romantic heartbreak to, to somewhere where it shouldn't be. I mean, of course, when he does say inappropriate romantic and it's just dot, 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 there isn't a word after that. If it were me interviewing here, that's where I want to go. I want to know what word don't you want to say there? Not, not that it might reveal very much, but if he doesn't want to say it and we can get him to say that word, it's going to produce emotion. It's going to un unpack emotion. And if we can unpack some more emotion from him, might be able to get him slightly out of control, therefore might be able to get him saying stuff that he didn't think he was going to say. So were it me, as Greg was saying there, you know, I'd be in, that's that's what I've got written down as that's the hot spot for me. That moment where he didn't use a word, that's what I want to find out about. Uh, that's what I got for that. Uh, Chase, what do you got? So we've got fading facts. Scott called it out here. He won't say relationship. We had this romantic uh, uh, with Amber Fry, but I want you to listen. It's at the last quarter of a second at the end of this clip, and you can listen again, at the very end, after the word fry, he just mixes up a jumble of sounds to, to mentally distance from that, that name even. And any interrogator has heard somebody in the interrogation room where the, somebody says, I have no idea what happened to Susan. Nifft. And, and I just throw something at the end of a name. I've heard it maybe a hundred times. I, I can't. Yep. I can't. You pointed that out on here before. You pointed that out once before. Which one was it? You, you know what you I think it is, Chase? On... Yeah. yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Whichever no, one you ahead. remember. But you know what I think it is? If you write a sentence and you edit it 
in Word or something like that, and you go through an edit, you leave junk at the end. When a person's trying to edit their story and they're under high pressure, what I think, and I've seen this a million times in Sears School, right? Because those are people speaking English and you're talking to them and you know the story. When they jumble all that up at the end, it's almost always because they've been trying to edit as they speak. And people are not good at that. It's true. That's my opinion. He, he does one more thing here I think is interesting. If you watch anytime Princess Diana was interviewed and they start asking her personal questions, her chin goes down, her eyes look mm. up. And I think Alan Pease uses a picture of her in the book to describe this, this behavior. And he does this while he's talking about, I know people think I'm guilty, but you know, I've got a lot of other stuff going on that makes me innocent. And we see that it, he doesn't do it at any other time except for right here, you see the shift from normal eye contact to head down, looking up. And this is the innocence. It's it's meant to portray innocence. Keep in mind, it's an unconscious portrayal of innocence, not conscious. I'm sorry, I forgot your question. <laughs> Did you ever hit her? Did you no, ever injure her? No, no, never. Um, I, was, I was answered your question because of the suspicion that it's been turned to me. And it turned to me because of the inappropriate romantic um, uh, that I had with Amber Fry. Now, remember, this one is, is uh, about the marriage, about the affair. Had you told anyone? Did you tell police? I told the police immediately. When? That was uh, the first night we were together. So the police, I spent um, with the police. You told them from, about her? Yeah, from December 24th on. <laughs> yeah, man. Genius. Genius. That's pretty bad. Okay, Mark, what do you got? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I've, I've never heard anything like this. So, first of all, I mean, what an example of fading facts. There's a vocal click at the start of his, um, his answer. That thing there. Usually, for me, that denotes there's something going on. There's something not quite right, even before you've started into it into this this that was uh the first night we were together the uh, the police i mean it's, it just becomes unintelligible what's going on and again back to this analogy of somebody at the bar i'm just going when's his head gonna hit the the bar smack and he's and he's out of this one uh eye blocks as well and it's just for me it's story soup now, there's a whole bunch of converge. I can't work out what he's talking about now. There's a convergence of different stories which are overlapping each other. I'm not sure he knows where he is in what story. And so I think we get this, this what seems to me an, a wince where one eye goes, goes in and the other eye opens up. I think it's like pain as he just goes, ah, there's a possibility of a great deal of inaccuracy now because he doesn't quite know where he is he's realized he's messed it up back there and it's that moment we've all done it where you signal that you're kind of kicking yourself you're kind of going oh what an idiot i am i shouldn't have <laughs> said that back there oh uh, uh, too late now uh you know you see it in bad performers all the time where you know if, you, if you're a performer if you're an actor you, you have to have a very buoyant attitude to the mistakes you make because otherwise your unconscious will just be feeding the audience all the times you're messing up and getting stuff wrong and you're in the wrong place at the wrong time and you haven't said the right word and your rhyming couplet is out and all there's all kinds of things that can go wrong so you just have this attitude of well that's past that's gone I, i'm never going to kick myself around that I'm, I'm on you're always trying to finish you're always trying to get to the end essentially well we see him kick himself during that and that for me is that that uh i wince there yeah it's completely falling to bits now um Terrible, terrible crime, uh, but quite funny from my, uh, certainly his performance, quite funny from my angle. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so my, I'm going to leave most of him alone. Just stop for a minute and watch Diane Sawyer. This is her mother face. This is the, she's a scolding mother. She starts with what I call the condemnation and disbelief. Look at her, her disgust in the corners of her mouth. She has kind of that little inverted turn up at the edge of her smile. Her brow is up with solid eye contact. I'm like, really? This is what you got? And then his story starts to fall apart. Agreed. I won't spend a lot of time on him. The one thing I will say is this. 
there's a cadence shift here when he's saying, I told him the first night. When we talk about cadence, Scott calls it loping, the story lopes. Well, this guy's story isn't loping, it's dragging along until he gets to something that's factual. I told him the first night, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, I don't know. But he is treating it like a fact, and it's a fact he's recovered in the middle of this soup, and his cadence speeds up, and he raises his hands a little. You just notice. The other thing to pay attention to is his body is getting smaller and smaller as this thing goes. Make the target smaller, maybe I won't get hit as hard. Um, Chase, what do you got? I think uh, right there in the beginning, Diane asks a question. Did you tell anyone about this? Anybody who's been to interrogator school, this is one of the questions we ask during the interview process at the beginning to say, is this guy probably guilty? Do I need to start an interrogation and make a, sh a transition? And innocent people. So let's say somebody you knew got got killed somehow, God forbid. You're going to tell people. You're going to tell your mom. You're going to call your friends, your parents. You're going to tell all kinds of people. Now imagine that you killed that person. You're not going to run home and grab your phone and go, yo, everybody, <laughs> guess what happened? You're way less likely to go broadcasting that information out. So asking that question, did you talk to anybody? Did you tell somebody about this? Can be very telling. I think maybe Diane got this. I'm sure Diane's had some very advanced trainings in, in doing some of these interviews. But I just want to read you the syntax of what was spoken. I'm going to read you Scott's words. Here they go. <laughs> Told the police immediately. That was uh, the first night we were together. The police. I spent uh, <laughs> with the police from December 24th on. That's the sentence. That's what we heard from. If uh, if you can make a sentence out of that, you're a better writer than I am. Scott? All right. I totally agree. Um, yeah. The last time I heard somebody say police, th th this guy says police three times in seven seconds. The last time I heard the word police used three times in less than seven seconds was during a breach where they're kicking a door in. And when you go in, that's what they're hollering. It's police, <laughs> police, police. So that's that you don't hear that quite often. I thought that was, that was fascinating to hear that because he keeps trying to say police to, to make it look like, yeah, I was there. Put that vision, that picture of him with them in, in her mind. Now mm -hmm. at the same time, um, we're seeing more body movements in this. His, his illustrators are getting bigger. And this is the loudest his volume has been when he's talking. Because I think he's getting, he's, he's trying to keep it under control because I don't think he was ready for that question. She, it's Diane So She might have said, yeah, we want to, we're only asking these questions. That's cool. I, I got you, boo. We don't you worry. I, we're going to take care of you. And then when he got to that, she's like zinged him with that, asking if, the, if, if he told the police about the affair. And obviously, and we can't, and couldn't find out, he didn't tell him. You know, it, it tells later on, you find out later on that he didn't tell. So he just totally just. I, I That's in fact what got him charged is his mistress said that she had told him a month before that his wife was dead. Yeah. That's yeah. He said she didn't even know. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're seeing more body movement overall up to this point and he's getting louder. So that's, that's keeping it simple. Everybody's covered pretty much everything else. Had you told anyone? Did you tell police? Told the police immediately. When? That was uh, the first night we were together. So the police I spent um, with the police. You told them from, about her? Yeah, from December 24th on. All right, we good? Yeah. Is this the umbrellas one? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> a piece of. There was one report that a neighbor had seen you loading something into a vehicle. I haven't seen that report. Did you load anything into a vehicle? A, anything large? Some umbrellas, some market umbrellas. Those are those, um, you know, the umbrellas on the stands that are you know, eight feet in diameter or something like that. When did you do that? That morning. Chase, what do you got? This is uh, <laughs> unbelievable. So from an audio perspective, I haven't seen that report. No one's asking if you've seen the report. <laughs> she didn't ask. So that's a 
ambiguity, failure to answer the question. So that's an eight already. Some umbrellas with an upward tone. This reminded me about a previous video we did. I couldn't remember what it was where Mark was giving an example of like, let's say you played music all your life and then somebody says, can you do a song about flowers? And you're like, no, I can't do it. Oh, yeah, yeah. you know what? I, I can do a song about flowers. So he just kind of coughed this up, offered it up. What I wish Diane would have done here, if I was coaching her, one of her assistants hands her an iPad or something that can play a video. And then she asks a bait question. And she says, Scott, I want you to think very carefully before you answer this question. Is there any reason that someone's security camera would have a video of you here loading something into the back of your car? And that's it. We're not, it's not a leading question. He, and if it, he didn't do anything wrong, he could just say no. And then we kind of get him in because he doesn't know if there's a video, what the video contains or what it shows. So it makes the nervousness and stress of being deceptive. It multiplies that stuff. And these are all incomplete sentences everywhere. Nonsensical statements. And I want you to notice the lips closing. When you see this again, every statement lips shut down right away. And he's saying, oh, it's a eight feet, or eight feet in diameter or something like that. And he's at max cognitive load here. His cognitive load, which is basically how much our CPU is being used up. He's maxed out. And he, add, he throws this umbrellas out there and then just throws in like, oh, that wasn't enough. Give her some more. And then he goes, marketing umbrellas. And just starts adding detail to it. This is the classic stuff you would see from a six-year-old uh, explaining something. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Guys, am I frozen? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought you were pissed off. <laughs> I kept putting I was getting the giggles, man. I don't know what I happened. Just... I don't know what happened. <laughs> I, I can see you guys, and I'm like, uh, I don't know what happened. Hang in there. <laughs> Hang in there a second. It's the best I can do it like <laughs> this. Give it just shut. Oh, oh, oh. So, what, so we, we're not going to give her. So, Greg, we're not going to give any pudding tonight after supper. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I just looked like my meds were a little low there. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So wow. you have to do that hand over to me again, Chase. No, you don't. I'm keeping all that. <laughs> oh, that's Go good. Ahead, I'm okay. I might just say my meds are <laughs> back. Uh, all right. And uh, Greg, what do you got? So let's call this one the too much. I'm going to go down three or four things that he does too much of. Number one, there's too much BS in the beginning. The stall, the chaff and redirect when he doesn't answer the question. I love that one, Chase. We're on the same page. Did you... Somebody said this about you. Well, I hadn't heard that. You know, okay, that's not what the question is. The other part that I love is she's telegraphing. Answer no. Answer no. Answer no. And he doesn't pick up on that. He has too much eye contact right out of the gate. Way too much eye contact. He's in romance or he's trying to connect with her. Maybe he finds himself charming and maybe he thinks he can charm Diane Sawyer. Not a good idea. Not working. He has too much info. You know those umbrellas that are eight feet? Well, he says umbrellas and then thinks, well, nobody's going to mistake my wife's, in my opinion, he, nobody's going to mistake my wife's body for an umbrella. So it must be a big umbrella. So then he has to go larger with that. And then the last piece, and I'll jump off of it at this, is he has too much anticipation and appreciation because the minute she he thinks that she has bought it, then he's quickly breaking away from it and he's ready to go and he says umbrellas boom and breaks away from it the other piece is when he, the last one i'll leave you with every time we've seen him go access eye movement it's down into his left down to his suddenly down to his right when he's talking about all these details about this elevator about these um, these umbrellas so too much too much too much he's gone from one kind of slagging along not being able to finish a sentence to giving Another not finished sentence, but with too much information. That's what I got. Uh, Scott. Okay. I'm trying yeah. to remember. Because I froze yeah. up. <laughs> that's, that's right. So when you, have, when you go into to fight or flight, 
and I think it was Joe Navarro that came up with freeze fight or flight. He added freeze to it. We see this in classic mode here. This is again a bit revisiting the classics. Is is fight or flight? Because when she asks him that question, he gives his answer. He freezes. He just sits there for like four seconds. Nothing happens, and like a champ, she doesn't say anything. She's sitting there letting let him heat up a little bit as he goes through that. So what happens is when you when you hit freeze, fight or flight, you freeze. For example, I think the, the good example is if if uh, the SWAT team's going in or they're surrounding a the house, getting ready to, to breach, go in the door, and there's there's something at the window. Everybody freezes. Everybody stops because you, what, somebody looking out the window is going to look for something moving. They're probably going to see everybody down there. But still, the, you, you freeze. That's the first thing you do. But you can't help but freeze when something happens. Because at that point, that's when you make up your mind. Am I going to have to fight somebody? I have to run off? I'm going to protect myself? What's going to happen? So we see him hit, hit, hit uh, the, the three Fs right there. Freeze, fight, or flight. We, we see him hit uh, freeze just right there. And he decides to fight. So he's, he's, he goes in with that really bad answer. And this is almost, it's like a Woody Allen movie back in the set, those 70s movies, Woody Allen movies. It's, it's hilarious. I, I don't I don't know what else to say. I think it's pretty much been covered. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, freeze, flight, fight, faint. He's he's getting close to the faint at the <laughs> yeah, end. The, the fourth uh, half. He, he does he does yeah he does freeze at the start. Then he does do flight because you see him retreat right back before he starts giving uh, this story. You do see anger at the end. So he does go for fight at the very, very end. You'll see the last expression, lips tighten up and he's got into in, into fight uh, at the end. Uh, you'll see actually in the next video, he's now getting close to, to faint and we'll hear that in his, his voice as well. Um, here's what I love about this is, is Diane Sawyer because she's using the Columbo method here, which, which is confusion and innocence. So she's playing this character of, I'm terribly confused by what I've heard and just very innocent about my knowledge level uh, around, around this to, to, to lower status and bait him in, in order to give something of an answer. And he does comply because he starts just talking nonsense around this. But the first move there is lower status, confusion, innocence, brilliantly done it's a great method if you ever want to use that is is don't come in with all the status don't come in with all the knowledge come in with not knowing and being very confused about stuff and and then here's what she does she gives the question with that confusion and knowledge and then she shuts up she says nothing yeah now a bit later on you're going to see him get wise to that <laughs> because he gives her a signal uh, in one of the other, in one of the videos coming, saying, I'm not falling for that one again. Not falling for that one. You're going to have to complete. I will answer a complete question, but I'm not falling for that routine anymore. So uh, great, great from her. Brilliant uh, performance. Great to see him go uh, to anger there. There, that's what I got for you. Excellent. There was one report that a neighbor had seen you loading something into a vehicle. No, I haven't seen that report. Did you load anything into a vehicle, or anything large? Some umbrellas, some market umbrellas. Those are those, um, you know, the umbrellas on the stands that are you know, eight feet in diameter or something like that. When did you do that? That morning. All right, all right. We good? We good? Yeah, yeah. I want to go back to a couple of other questions people have. I've heard so many people say, Christmas Eve, mm. you have a very pregnant wife, and you decide to go fishing? Mm -hmm. What did that say about the two of you? Well, um, we had plans that evening with mom, Lacey's mom, over at her house. Um, frankly, uh, Christmas preparations were, were done. What did you get her for Christmas? Oh, a Louis Vuitton wallet. Um, but preparations were made. Um, her plan for the day was to prepare gingerbread cookies. Um, my day was open to um, either play golf or go fishing. I chose fishing that day, which is, you know, a uh, choice I made, and I obviously regret now, you know, if I could just decide to stay home. 
this would not have happened. All right, I'll go first on this one. If on Christmas Eve, if my wife is pregnant, and I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go fishing. There would have been a murder, and you would have seen it on the news. On those little <laughs> crappy iPhone cell videos, cell phone videos of my wife with a bunch of uh, fishing poles and a, whatever you, a tackle box, that's what would have happened. <laughs> so, yeah, there would have been a murder that night, but it wouldn't be mur me murdering her. He answers with that, uh-huh. Then he waits. Then there's four seconds. And she, again, she just, I love this woman. I think she's awesome because she knows when not to say anything. I know she's a pro and all that. But she she does exactly what we'd wanted to do. She just sits there. And he, and he doesn't blink. He doesn't do anything. He's like, eh. And she says, what? And then his eyebrows go up. But he's focused hard on her. And then she says, what does, what does that say about the two of you? When he's, she says, yeah, I was going to go fishing, and it, it's, it's okay. And then, uh, so this chin starts to go down, and then he starts to talk in that childish tone, whether he's trying to talk to a child or, is, or sees himself as a child as he's doing. I can't figure out which one it is, but nobody talks like that. you know. And then he says weird stuff like, frankly, the Christmas preparations were done. So I think... I don't know what he's doing at this point. I think he's just going for it. He's like, okay, I'm in. I'm going. I'm going. I can't decide if he thinks he's already busted or what at this point. I can't see it on him because he's. It just. It's just not working. It's just not. It's, I think it's sliding out of control for him. Chase, what do you got? If you go back to Diane Sawyer's interviews and listen to her questions, a little around half of them aren't questions at all. They're statements. And these are what's called elicitation statements. So it's a statement that provokes a response, which is what this is. And you decide to go fishing. Then she just kind of leaves it. And he can't say his wife's name, which is interesting. And he corrects himself after he realizes, oh, shoot, I didn't say her name. And when... I think when Diane Sawyer says you have a very pregnant wife as a coach or as an interrogator, I would have used her name very, very vividly uh, in that moment. <clears throat> and I love the preparations comment, so I'll skip over it. But guilty people will tend to wish something else happened when innocent people will be more likely to say, if I hadn't had done that, they would be alive today. So they would they would say an if then statement. Guilty people are just are more prone to say, I wish it didn't happen that way, or I wish I hadn't have done that. And when you hear people talking about regret, just like the last video, regret is me saying something that I regret doing to provide you with evidence for my innocence. And She's a master at elicitation, either way. And I think this slimy piece of stuff is enjoying this immensely. During this dramatic pause, she asks that question, and he's sitting there, and he starts smiling. Oh, I, I wanted to stab my uh, iPad screen today just watching this thing. Uh, but he gets excited when he when he's asked to offer up what he got her for Christmas with a smug, self-satisfied grin. I can't confirm that scientifically. That's biased. That's a biased statement. Uh, but after he says Louis Vuitton wallet, and you get the eye blocking behaviors off the charts here. Mark. Yeah, lovely. Uh, so it. it Turns out, I think, Scott, that you can go fishing at Christmas if preparations have already been made. <laughs> just, just so you know. Just so you know. Okay. In, 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 in world of Scott Peterson, it's totally fine. You just have to go, have preparations been made? Your wife will go, preparations have been made. And you go, <laughs> off you go. Off you go fishing. All, all fine. I don't know where you've been. <laughs> If you'd have only known that, you could have done more more fishing on uh, on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve. Anyway, with a pregnant um, wife, yeah, yeah, yeah pregnant. Oh, yeah. So, so look, um, very different tone of voice here, very different rhythm, and then it's gone way, way down. It's even, it's his lowest energy yet. He's even got some vocal fry going on, which means he's really under-energizing the vocal cords uh, there. Um, I think it's because he's going towards 
faint now. The stress is too high. We see a recovery on the Louis Vuitton wallet. Notice how the tempo changes completely and the tonality changes, because that's an easy one for him to answer. I think it's probably very true that he did buy a Louis Vuitton wallet. It's like, whoa, I can do that one. Like, that's one I can do. There you go. And he's like buoyant again, and then boom, crashes uh, again, straight into under-energized, stressed uh, vocal fry. We're now seeing way more sheen on his face now. I think we're say seeing way more anxiety uh, playing through uh, on this, more pet uh, perspiration. I think he's heating up because his management system around this is is uh, is overheating. Oh, and it's in this one that we get that eyebrow raise at the start, which I was talking about. I think the eyebrow raise that he does at the start is he's, he's on to Sawyer now and he's like, I am not going in on this one until you complete your question. She got him on the last one. She's playing the same tack with him on this of like, I just don't understand it. I mean, it's not me. It's like other people have been saying this. I'm, I'm with you, but we've got to deal with these other people. I don't understand why they can't get the idea that you can't go fishing on Chris. I would let you go fishing on Christmas day if it were me. I don't understand it. So he knows she's going somewhere with this. She goes silent. He raises his eyebrow to go, yeah, you're gonna have to give me more on this. Bring bring in some more before I answer this one. So, so he's under stress, but he's a little bit wise there. Um, yeah, just any, any, any panel, panelists out there watching, it is okay to go fishing on Christmas day if your wife is pregnant. Um, just if preparations have been made already. So just check that out beforehand. Uh, who have we got left? Uh, Greg, what you got? Yeah, so I'm going to take this in a little different direction. Preparations have been made, came up three times, if I remember correctly. So yeah, preparations have been made. It didn't always look happy when he said preparations have been made. Maybe that's a sore point. Don't know. But if you bring it up three times, it means something. So in my world, I'm going to punch you in the face with it. I'm going to come back at you with it. That's an interrogation one-on-one. Well, you said it three times, so it must mean something. And one of those times he said, but. But means resistance in some capacity. And when I hear but, preparations have been made, I'm like, hmm, let's ask. Also, when he said the Louis Vuitton wallet, he did a little bit of drawing back. For me, now I'm wondering, is there some baggage around that? Was that a reason? So I'll dig in. I don't know. And if you look at him, his posture's getting smaller. I love that we all saw the, okay, give me what you got. That brow come up because he knows he's set up. I'm going to not beat this one to death. There are a whole bunch of things in here around distaste. His tongue juts out when he's talking about a couple of things in here. At 39 seconds in this video, and if you, Scott, go back and find it, you'll find there's internal conversation and a curt mouth. I mean, his lips go straight and hard. Something's going on in his head there. That's right before preparations were made the second time, if I recall correctly. And then there's a thing called embedded confessions, where people cannot get away from telling you the truth. I think we might be seeing that. This is my own assumption, and I'd have to have control of the conversation to dig into this. If I had just decided to stay home, this would never have happened. Did he choose not to go fishing, but to do something else? And that led to an argument, which led to, I would have to dig into that one, because that's an awkward set of words. Yeah, her body would still be in the house if he'd not taken the boat out. That part we know is true, based on what we've learned to date. But if I had just decided, just, just, if I had just decided to stay home, this would not have happened. And you see a little bit of a smile there. To me, I think there may be something there. And if I were interrogating this guy, I'd crank the heat up right there because his body has shrunken. His body is not where it was in the beginning. I'll also go back and go in the very beginning of this video and watch him as he's moving. His head movement, his eye movement, his demeanor is very different than when he's in this interview. That's what I expect is his baseline. And we're getting something prepared, canned, and this control release is coming out. So when we get down to this last piece, now crank up the heat and go after him. I think you'll get something. I want to go back to a couple of other questions people have. I've heard so many people say, Christmas Eve, mm. you have a very pregnant wife, and you decide to go fishing? Mm -hmm. What did that say about the two of you? Well, um, we had plans that evening with mom, Lacey's mom, over at her house. 
Um, frankly, uh, Christmas preparations were, were done. What did you get her for Christmas? Oh, a Louis Vuitton wallet. Um, but preparations were made. Um, her plan for the day was to prepare gingerbread cookies. Um, my day was open to um, either play golf or go fishing. I chose fishing that day, which is, you know, a uh, choice I made and I obviously regret now, you know, if I could just decide to stay home. That's what would have happened. Right, right. Nice. Right, right, we good? good? Yeah. 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 Right, let's move along. Tell me about the nursery. Can't go in there. The door is closed until there's someone to put in there. But it's ready. All right, Greg, what do you got? Well, I'm just so emotional I can't share with you. I mean, there's nothing here, guys. I mean, guys who cry, any of us who cry, we're going to wipe away our tears, not give you the dramatic effect. This is, again, the thing you're talking about, feigned emotional display, right? Mm -hmm. Looking at me. I'm, I'm not even going to beat that one up. Every person on here, could he have emotion because he feels guilty for what he did? Yeah, and maybe... He mustered everything he had to come up with some tears. Maybe. Maybe he's really feeling guilty because he knows that everything's tightening in on him. I'm not going to try to figure out what's in his head. I'm going to say that's awfully out of place considering he's not used the name of his wife or the kid or anything else. And suddenly it's about this place, not about his wife's body, not about she's missing, not about any of that. It just feels out of place. If she's just missing and it's just a few hours – Okay, then why is he crying about the baby baby room? Because he knows. So I'll leave it at that. And I will then say, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, it'd be pretty easy for him to convert the stress that he's in because he's been hit and faint. So it would be pretty easy for him to convert that feeling into tears. And I think that's what he's trying to generate uh, right now. He, do, he does, he manages it. He does, he does get there. Um, he, he really is acting the role right now, I would suggest, of a poet and a romantic, because he's now going to show us a really big, what, what I call grand narrative. So a big story, one of these, one of the, you know, the big stories that everybody understands, which is the idea of loss and rebirth, which means hope. So there is, there's nothing to go in the kids' room, but if there, another one was to come along, then the door would open again. And what a great, you know, metaphor and, and reality that he plays there. He's, he's trying to give us the story of um, out of death, there comes hope, and out of hope, there comes something new. And that's quite smart because it's, it's difficult for us not to get attracted to that idea. We will, for sure, as human beings, we'll get wound up in that narrative idea because it's a beautiful idea. You lose a kid, but hey, another one could come along and the room could be used again. But until that time, we will not touch it, but there is hope that it could open again. Just great storytelling there. And what we need to understand is it is a distraction. He's doing it to distract us and take us away from the, from the fact that he has killed the wife and the unborn child here. Um, but great distraction technique. And watch out that for that with, with people who will suddenly go into big, big stories that you'll get wound up in, the, 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 the epic drama of them, because this is an epic drama that he's spinning us now. Uh, Chase, what do you got? I think anybody who would say, I'm not going to open it until there's someone to go in there. He's either A, saying someone else, his son's never going to go in there, or B, replacing his son's name. Who's Connor, by the way? Connor was his name. He has a grave with his mother. And he's using someone instead of saying Connor or instead of saying my son. And there's no pronouns in here at all. 
which is one of the most, according to me, one of the most highly deceptive things you can do is to provide some long narrative that has about your experience that has no self-referential or team referential pronouns in it. And he fails to say a lot of this stuff, but I want you to pay attention to, I think the shame and guilt that you're seeing here on the chin boss. And with this downward eye movement here, I think that's a real shame about something that happened, but I don't, I don't think it's about what he's telling you that it is. And really quickly go back through all this. And when he says I had nothing to do with her disappearance, he already considers her disappearance to be a crime from, from the first minute. It's not, I didn't have anything to do with it, or I don't know where she is. There's a massive difference between I had nothing to do with her disappearance. That way, the word disappearance is a crime. So his statement alone assumes criminal behavior. From and the then the baby not coming back. Yeah. And he'll, he, he knows the baby's not coming back because he knows it's not coming in. Can't go in there. And that's all I got. Scott? All right. This is the creepiest, most grotesque answer to a question I've ever heard that we've done so far on this. Because he's, he doesn't even talk about his child like it's, like you said, Chase. He doesn't even name him. Doesn't even say it was my kid or a child until a baby, anything like that. He says until there's someone to be put in there or to put in there. So that's just, that's, that's, that says everything that says everything. right there. And it's so quiet. Again, the sound guys got to be going nuts on this. He's probably so mad. He can hardly stand it, but you can hardly hear him talking. And she never says to him, dude, you got, I can't hear you do what perfect time to say, speak up, man. I don't know what you're talking about to get to, to help fire him up some, but again, it's TV and she's probably doing that for, for the, the TV vibe they're trying to get but yeah so that's the grossest thing i've ever seen on on the stuff we've done that's 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 just that's the worst that shows no respect for his child that shows no respect for little children it shows no respect for life or for what you know for his wife or his child no respect whatsoever so that has nothing to do with body language <laughs> that's all from an emotional st- well, I always apparently lately i'm getting one of these where i just like yeah and ran on but <laughs> Sorry you know, here's that. here's the thing for you. If you want to if you want to pull emotion up to the top, just sit with your eyes down to your right and start dwelling on things that live there. It will. And Mark, you probably have coached many people to do yeah. this, but if you put your head, you'll look emotional by looking down into your right. And if you keep your eyes there long enough, you'll start to dwell on things that matter. And if you pick up one negative thing, it's going to boil up emotion in you. It helps. It gives you an ability. Interrogators, we have to pretend that we care sometimes and pretend we're emotional yeah. when we aren't. And it's a powerful tool for it. Yeah. Tell me about the nursery. Can't go in there. The door is closed until there's someone to put in there. But it's ready. Okay. Well, now what we're going to do is something we've never done before. And we've got one more video that we're going to play you. And it's we're not going to tell you about it. We're just going to show you. And it's a great one, too, for this. It's the perfect video for this. So take a look at this video, and then you let us know what you think about it in the comments. Are you afraid police will arrest you? No. I know there's, there's no basis. I, mean, I had nothing to do with their disappearance. So there, there's no... Uh, you know, possible evidence or anything like that. All right. Well, there's that video. Now, we're not going to give you anything about that. We want to know what you think. We're going to see how much you're learning if you're actually watching this. So let us know what you think. Now, let's throw it around the room and see what everybody thinks where they give it on a percentage really quickly, a percentage on a 1% to 100% where you're seeing um, deception and where you're seeing truth. Greg, you want to go first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no way I would believe this guy. I would take him to pieces over the way he responded to these questions from rambling answers that did not answer to redirects to even possibly an embedded confession, the kind of thing you don't see all the time. This one, thumbs down. Don't believe him. Don't trust him. Never mind the fact he's, you know, he's been found guilty by trial. Just all of this acting that he is doing that's really poor. I, I just don't get it. So with acting, Mark, how about you take it next? 
Yeah, uh, look, here's what I know to be true, or I would stake a lot to be true. He did buy a Louis Vuitton wallet. <laughs> Okay. Now, <laughs> stick down below if I'm wrong, because maybe you know. No, no, that was a complete lie as well. But I reckon it's that's probably pretty accurate. There was a Louis Vuitton wallet bought for Christmas. Uh, the rest of it, I mean, so much fading facts, grand narratives put in there, uh, just story soup going on as well. Uh, you know, from from really two to three videos in, we know something uh, bad is happening here. So yeah, poor performance. Uh, bad liar, bad crime, uh, total liar. Scott, what do you got? All right. I give him uh, a 97% in deception. And then I give him that, that 3% of told the truth. I, again, you're right about the Louis Vuitton wallet. He did that. And then I think uh, he did put something in the, in the, he did pack something away, but it wasn't those umbrellas. So I'm going to give him part of that. He did put something in the, in the car, in the vehicle, but it wasn't the umbrella. So I'm 97 and three. Chase, what do you got? Yep, Mark, I'll see your story soup and I'll raise you a word salad. <laughs> Love it. Which is what I thought of this whole thing. And I think for that final, I agree with your 97 and three. And for that final 1% of truthful behavior, I think the shame and guilt in the final video that we reviewed, not the one that you guys looked at, uh, was genuine shame and guilt. All right. All right. Well, please subscribe. Because we're, um, as you know, every week we do one of these on Thursday. We get them out Wednesdays if we get them edited quick enough. But go ahead and subscribe and, and uh, you'll know when we have something come out. All right. We good to go? Yeah. Good. Good. Right. Yeah. There's double in the can. Yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Well, behavior panel. This weekend, this Sunday, it's high flying, freewheeling, bone jar, and trucks. All the way down from Canada, it's going to be Major Matt Bowden coming on in with Bigfoot. After that, it's Chase Hughes. What's he driving? He's driving a little squiggler. That's what he calls her. Next up is Greg Hartley. Here comes Greg now. What's he driving? The Caterwaller. Yeah, he calls it the Grave Digger. <laughs> this is the BBC World Service. Dang, That's that sounds perfect. good, man. That was good. That sounds really good. We should all do our intros like this. Okay, let's do now, it. Now, I'm going to be whispering Bill. <laughs> <laughs> she cut up my legs. Let's all do a <laughs> intro like that. And now okay. the shipping forecast. There are storms in Cromarty, Biter, Riga, and more. Except for the people who listen to us for the first time and be like, what the f is this? And turn it off. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. So should we do them that way and say that's why sure. we do Let's give it a go. Let's then? give it a go for fun. Well, no. All right. <clears throat> Let's do them both ways in case it sounds stupid. <laughs> all right. Okay. Are right, you ready? Yeah. Here we go. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst. And I train law enforcement in the military and interrogation body language. I also created the number one online body language course, Body Language Tactics with Greg Hartley. Mark Bowden. I'm up Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate including some leaders of the G7. Chase. Hi, I'm uh, Chase Hughes. I did 20 years in the U.S. military. And now I do interrogation training, profiling, influence, and persuasion with intelligence agencies and the general public. I'm also the number one best-selling author of the Ellipsis Manual on Human Behavior and Persuasion. Mr. Hartley. I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, and I spend most of my time on Wall Street and in corporate America. That's great, Greg. Thanks so much. I really like that. I'm sure the listeners do as well. Now, today we're going to talk about Scott Peterson. He's a murderer. <laughs>